This is the fourth in a series of recordings dealing with screening designs. This is uh, the notes for, um, let's see, screening designs part two, which you should read before watching the video. And in this particular video, we're going to lay the groundwork for what we know today as optimal screening designs. Uh, a lot of the designs being used today are quite different from the traditional and often orthogonal designs. And in this section, we're going to talk, talk about the concepts behind what are called these uh, optimal screening designs, which also happen to be uh, very efficient. Okay, so we've talked about uh, fractional factorials. We talked about Plackett-Berman designs and pointed out that some of the problems with Plackett-Berman designs are that they're orthogonal for main effects, but unfortunately the main effects are heavily aliased with two-way, partially aliased with two-way interactions. So it can be difficult to figure out what are really the important effects. Not to mention if the two-way interactions or some of them are uh, important, they have a big effect, and you don't have them in the model, they will significantly bias okay, the estimated effects of some of the individual main effects in the design. However, the idea of non-orthogonal designs is important. The original designs, for instance, that Fisher used were orthogonal, but this is a different era, and the demands on experimentation are such that we have to find um, cost-effective alternatives. Okay. So what I want to talk about is the fact that if we generate a design, of course, again, we, we know about Plackett-Berman's and two-level designs, but what if, in general, we had general constraints on the number of runs? So I said, well, I want to do 9, or I want to do 13. Well, there are no traditional designs that would uh, work for those number of runs. And it turns out there are probably infinite combination of designs that, out there that might work. The question is, how could we find a design efficiently for, say, some odd number of runs and some number of effects you want to estimate. And this leads us to the modern concept of optimal designs. And indeed, underneath the hood, this is what's going on in the custom design platform in Jump. And it is actually quite unique among statistical software packages in what it's able to do in terms of generating designs. Okay, So when I talk about optimal, and I don't want to get into a lot of mathematical detail, but I'll give you the basics. There are three types of optimality that we consider in creating a design. One is called de-optimal. This gives you the most precise estimates of the experimental effects. I-optimal, which gives you the most model precision. And finally, alias-optimal. This is very unique to jump in which the goal is actually to come up with a design that gives you the least amount of partial aliasing. Okay. No other software package actually does what's called alias optimal. And in many cases, it's a very good choice for a screening design. Okay. So again, if you'd like to get more theoretical background on optimality, I recommend uh, pages 33, 34, and 35, chapter 2 of the Hoos and Jones book. But let me explain D-optimal. And the D stands for mathematical determinant of a covariance matrix. Again, I will not hold you accountable for the linear algebra. But the covariance matrix is a matrix which contains the uh, covariances or correlations among the various estimated effects. And D-optimal means I generate the design so that I get the most precise estimates of the coefficients, the smallest um, estimation error when I estimate the effects in the model. 
Okay. So we'll talk about I-optimal and alias-optimal a little bit later. So let's start with D-optimal. And for screening designs, D-optimal might be a good choice. Again, what it's going to do when you generate the design, it'll search for a design that gives you the most precise estimates of the coefficients. And it turns out, this is directly related to the determinant of what I call the covariance matrix of the uh, which contain the variances and covariances among the estimated effects. So here's how you proceed. You specify the model. You say here are the effects I wish to estimate. Specify the total number of runs you can afford and I won't get into this right now. If you want to put constraints on the experimental region, you can also put in linear constraints and jump, saying this is the only region, and it can be very oddly shaped, where I want to experiment. In other words, it doesn't necessarily have to be a cube and so forth. Uh, you can actually identify the region. Okay. Now, when we generate D-optimal designs, the goal is to minimize the variance of the coefficient estimates. It turns out these designs can be far from orthogonal in terms of, of the effects. However, they are often are near uh, orthogonal and uh, generally are very effective for what we call screening experimentation just trying to understand what's significant. And there's a way that jump measures D-optimality. I will not get into the details. You'll see it in the uh, jump output. It's called the chi-squared efficiency. It says somewhat mathematical. The details are actually given in jump help. Okay. So, there are a couple of ways we could go. One, we could go to screening designs, okay, the screening platform, and select the option to generate near orthogonal designs for main effects. Okay. I'm just showing you this. This is an option in screening. Most often, as you'll notice, we'll pick the first option, which is traditional fractional factorials and placket Bermans but you can generate these D-optimal designs in some cases. Okay. So how do we do this? I'm just going to show you quickly because I'm actually going to use custom design. So I specify five factors and I want nine runs. Okay. Here's the design. Okay. That's all it was. I said uh, by the way, in the background, jump is assuming you want to estimate main effects only. It's not even thinking about interactions. So this would be purely a minimal sized screening design. Okay. So it won't be exactly orthogonal, but again, it will probably be very close to it. The good side is it's nine runs. This is a non-traditional design but maybe it fits within your experimental constraints. Okay. And one of the ways we could check for orthogonality is to generate the design and just look at correlations among the factors. And you will notice, even though if it's not orthogonal, notice the correlations. They're only 0.1. So in the ideal scenario, these would be all zeros for, for an orthogonal design. But our design is pretty close to orthogonal. Close enough that we're not going to worry about the non-orthogonality. Okay. <clears throat> now, let's suppose I generate the design. And I want to take a look at two-way interactions. Remember, I generated this design as a main effects only design. But I've got enough runs that I could potentially look at two-way interactions 
but I better be careful. So take a look at this alias matrix and notice, and I'll go ahead and uh, let's pick X1. So let's very carefully circle X1. Notice it is partially aliased with every potential two-way interactions. So this may be a screening design, but we'd better hope none of these two-way interactions are too active, or I'm going to heavily bias the estimate of X1. So from the standpoint of orthogonality, they're pretty good. This nine-run uh, de-optimal design, from the viewpoint of partial aliasing, this design isn't so hot. So you better be very certain that you do not expect to see serious two-way interactions occurring. And oh, by the way, in any real experiment, it, you'd be hard-pressed to actually know one way or the other, to be quite honest with you. Okay. So now let's take a look at generating custom designs. Um, using jump. So we'll go to the custom design platform. And let's suppose I have um, seven continuous factors. So I'll just pick seven continuous factors. Okay. And I'm going to stipulate the model. Now I'll show this in a moment. So I have seven main effects and I've picked only two two-way interactions. So in optimal designs, not only can I pick the number of runs, I can even specify the effects I want to estimate in the model. Okay. So I've decided I want to do 13 runs, and I'm going to add three center points. Okay. By default, Jump is going to do a de-optimal design. Okay. So again, Jump uses a search algorithm, which is not of direct concern to us. Um, because there are literally infinite possible de-optimal designs. Jump uses a very efficient search algorithm called the Bayesian Coordinate Exchange Algorithm. Again, Hoos and Jones explain it. And here is a design that it's come up with. Again, optimal designs are not unique. The algorithm stops when it finds a solution, but there could be other solutions. Finally, let's take a look at the alias matrix. Okay. Um, so notice, once again, um, there is some considerable okay, aliasing among two-way interactions. Again, these designs are often used for screening purposes. And we're assuming that the main effects are really dominant. If that is not the case, you could go badly wrong. I'm going to say more about this later on. But uh, in point of fact, I mean, we have come up with a really efficient design to study seven factors. Okay. <clears throat> and we notice, though, for the main effects, if we look at the correlation matrix, it's pretty close to orthogonal. So that's not bad. The bigger problem is the partial aliasing with the two-way interactions. So you need to have some confidence that two-way interactions will not be big effects. OK. So let's go take a look at jump. I know where jump is here. OK. So I go to DOE. I'll go to custom design. In custom design, in the main report menu, okay, notice this called optimality criterion. These are different types of uh, designs. And recommended is actually de-optimal. What's called make de-optimal is something we call Bayesian de-optimal. So I'm going to leave it with de-optimal. As i show shown, I'll add seven factors. Okay, they're all continuous. They don't have to be, but let's make them continuous. Okay. Now the model. So I'm just going to add a 
couple of interactions just for illustration. So I've added x1, x7, and let's just add something else x2, x5. Okay. Now, how many runs am I going to do? I could do as little as 10, but let's do 13. And once again, I'm going to add three center points because I do like to have some replication. So jump is searching for a solution. And this is a very intense, numerically intense, uh, or computationally intense search that it's doing. So it takes time. So it's searching, searching. D efficiency is basically it's comparing a D optimal to a theoretical D optimal. So it's about 85%. So there's my design. In other words, its D optimality is 85% of a hypothetical. It's just more or less a benchmark. Rarely would you achieve 100% for most optimal designs. Okay. So let's take a look at the alias matrix. Okay. So from the alias matrix, we can see that there is some amount of partial aliasing. And I'm just going to go ahead and make the table. Okay. So there's my table. And if you wanted to see the correlation of the main effects, you can do that by going to the Analyze menu, Multivariate Methods, Multivariate, put in your seven factors, and you get a correlation table. So this particular design is even better than the one I showed in the notes. It's near orthogonal. Again, the, the real issue isn't orthogonality, it's the partial aliasing. And that's how we generate a d-optimal design. Now I'm going to go back and let's see, do I want to do this? Yep, I'm going to go back to my design. I'm going to back up. Now I've specified uh, for my model that I wanted to do, let's say, 13 runs. And I need uh, a minimum, we'll jump to saying a minimum of 13 because of the center points. But what if I decide I only wanted to do 11? <clears throat> well, you'd say, well, you don't have enough runs. Well, here's a trick in jump. Notice where it says necessary, meaning it must be in the model. Click on that and change. I'm going to change the two interactions. I didn't mean to switch that one. The two interactions to if possible. So I'm going to get both of them and change them to if possible. We're going to generate what is referred to as a Bayesian D-optimal design. What this means is that the software is going to do a search to make sure it can estimate all the terms I've said, if possible. But if they could find a design that will also let it include two-way interactions, then it will include that design. So it's adding a little extra to the search in that it's also trying to see if there's some way we could add in a couple of additional factors. Okay. So it's still D-optimal, okay. and I am specifying a minimum of 11 runs. Okay. We make the design. So it's found an 11 run design. Okay. And we look at the alias matrix. Okay. And looking at the design, notice we've got a substantial amount of partial aliasing. But in effect, it is potentially possible that we could 
estimate. Uh, it has found a, a way to um, estimate the two-way interactions with the design we have. Okay. So that's called Bayesian D-optimal. It has to do with the method it's using to find it. And sometimes if we have a lot of effects, we can't do a lot of runs, the Bayesian D-optimal is a nice idea because it lets you say, all right, I really must estimate these effects, but if possible, try to also include these effects in the design. Okay. So this steps you through the uh, design. Notice this is a Bayesian D-optimal design. I'll just show you what I did. So here I specified eight runs, okay? And I sp specified all the two-way interactions. Okay, so this is a uh, five-factor design. Okay? So there are 10 two-way interactions, and I want to do eight runs. Um, this is, there are just simply too many effects to estimate. So I put all the two-way interactions as if possible. It gave me a solution, but notice that there is a very messy aliasing structure. So in this particular case, you should check the aliasing structure of the design. Here, it, it's, this is actually resolution three. I would actually go back and consider adding more runs to the design if I really wanted to estimate those uh, two-way interactions. Okay. And then finally, there's one last type of design, and this is unique um, to jump because Brad Jones is one of their chief developers, and Chris Noxheim is a professor at uh, University of Minnesota. And they came up with what they call the alias optimal design. In this design, the objective is to find a design that minimizes aliasing. Remember the alias matrix we looked at earlier? This design looks at the uh, transpose of the alias matrix times the alias matrix. Again, I won't get into all the math. and tries to minimize the diagonal elements. It minimizes the trace of that matrix. And what that means is it's minimizing potential aliases. Uh, minimal alias designs are often close to de-optimal. They may not be. But however, the minimum uh, minimization of aliasing, I think, uh, is more important than de-optimality if you really think things like two-way interactions are possible. So I'm going to actually show an example of this. Okay. Uh, again, we'll just go over to jump. There we go. Okay. So we'll bring jump over. Go to DOE custom. I'm going to add five factors. I'll do the example in the notes. Okay. And under the main report menu, I go to optimality criterion, okay, make alias optimal. And there's also an option in here. Uh, let's see, I did make it alias optimal. I want to make sure. And under advanced options, you can specify the minimum um, de optimality. So let's say. I want it to be 90% of a de-optimal. So in creating the design, Jump may be doing some trade-off between de-optimality and minimizing the aliases. Click Continue. <clears throat> I'm going to, um, let's see, put in all two-way interactions and change them all to if possible because I'm not going to have enough runs to do all of them. So very quickly, I'm just going through these, making them all, if possible. Okay. And then <clears throat> I'm going to specify 
<coughs> eight runs, as I showed in the notes. Okay. And in aliasing terms, I want to put in all the two-way interactions. Okay. So make the design. So it's searching for a solution. Okay, so we take a look at the design. Okay. Take a look at the alias matrix. You know, this is pretty good, really. I'm quite serious. Take a look at this. Okay. So it's close to D-optimal. Let's see, what is its efficiency? Somewhere in here it gives you, oh, design diagnostics. Oh, it didn't, it didn't actually calculate it. It doesn't do it for D-optimal, uh, Bayesian D-optimal designs. So basically, overall, this is about as good as we can do. And to illustrate, I'm going to pick the option simulate a response. I'm going to make the table. Okay. So I'm just going to throw in some coefficients. I'm just randomly doing this. Okay. And then to run the model. Okay, so it's put in all of these two-way interactions. Still not completely guaranteed. I can estimate all of them. So I start with the factorial to degree 2 model. And indeed, you can see there is a problem. And actually, you could, could have seen this in the alias matrix if you go back and look. For instance, H, uh, X5 is aliased with X1, X4, and you can see it right there. Okay. So I would have to trim down the model. But again, I've tried to run this design with an incredibly small number of runs. Uh, you typically will have to spend some time looking at it. You may try increasing the number of runs. Uh, frankly, this is about as good as you're going to do. Five factors, eight runs, you're literally going to be finding a design uh, that has resolution three. You, you would actually need more runs. Okay. So basically, that concludes the discussion of D-optimal designs, Bayesian D-optimal designs, and what we call alias optimal. And for purposes of screening, just looking for important effects, Generally, I recommend the alias optimal designs because literally it's the aliasing that causes trouble when people are trying to do screening.